when you think of leaders, when you think of leadership, who comes to mind? Do uh, some great political leaders of the, the past or through the years come to mind? Do, do uh, people who are really famous and important come to mind? Or do just some really ordinary people come to mind? Do any of these people come to mind? Okay, this happens to be our elder board. And um, you can see um, a Caleb as the, the, the newest one uh, on there. And, uh, and our elder board, you know what's interesting? I, I've told you a number of things so far. One of the other things that we do in our constitution and bylaws is we have no limits on how many people can serve on our elder board. Because as the church grew, you'd want to have other people out there serving and, and doing it. So we have a minimum, but we have no maximum. And usually a board has, oh, you know, the, there are five or six or seven, usually an odd number, so that if there's a vote that doesn't get along, you have, you know, three to four or whatever, something like that. We don't do that. We just say, let's just throw that number out. Whatever God brings our way, let's look at them and, and let's do it. Now, each one of these guys teach and, and serve in, you know, with people in a, a caring teaching capacity. Each one of these people uh, that you see on the screen are leaders. But that's not why they're elders. I want you to catch the difference there. A leader, you can have great leadership, but that doesn't mean they're great caring people. That doesn't mean they're great shepherds. That doesn't mean they even teach. That means that they're really strong and high D on the leadership scale or something. They're out there doing that. But all these lead, but all these care. All these teach. But it's not the leadership that makes them an elder. As a matter of fact, let me drop this on the screen. Might surprise you. The word leadership occurs 90 times in the Old Testament, five times in the New Testament. And this is the Christian Standard Bible, the 2017 edition, the right off the press this year. 90 times leader occurs in the Old Testament. But let me, and do you see the difference there? All of a sudden, Old Testament, what did they need? They had a Moses and they had a Joshua. But when it came to the New Testament, what happens to that word leadership? Matter of fact, even let me say this. The word leadership in the New Testament is only used when it comes to synagogue leaders. The Old Testament designed for that. Let me slide this down and put the New American Standard on the screen so you can see uh, somewhat of the difference in the word leadership, okay? The word leader in the New American Standard, which was uh, translated back in 1977, occurs 65 times in the Old Testament and only four times in the New Testament. So why the difference? Well, the difference is because some translations, whether it's the English Standard Version, the King James Version, the New American Standard Version, other versions use the word ruler or chief or authority, and they don't use leader. So I, I just wanted to get a grasp on this because whether they use chief or, or ruler or leader, what happens in the New Testament? Where does that word go? kind of right out the window. Because we're not just looking for people, oh, they're a leader, let's put them on the elder board. No, we're looking for people that have qualifications. I said to you, there are static qualifications. They're never gonna change. You're the husband of one what? One wife. You rule your house well. You're apt to teach. You're not given to wine. Here's those biblical standards that never change. And then there are some dynamic things that aren't necessarily spelled out clearly in God's word, but that we look at and say, okay, if the church, when we started the church 30 years ago, and we were trying to reach unsaved, unchurched people, how many, how many elder qualified people do we have? We weren't sure we had any. 
So we made a, we called it a council of servants. And we just said, we, we chose uh, 12 guys that we're getting to know and said, we'll disciple them. And they seem to, you know, we'll see from there if our, if our elder board comes out of that a little bit. But so if the church is way down here in their biblical knowledge, the first Sunday when I said greeting time, I made the mistake of, of doing, doing two things. I said, uh, on the count of three, I want you to turn around and shake hands with the person behind you. Well, what happens on the count of three? Everybody turned around, and everybody was facing everybody's back. <laughs> so, so, oh, hi, nice to meet you, you know. I got your back. But, and then I said, uh, and find somebody who knows John 3.16. Well, you've got a, a whole church of unsaved, unchurched people. And how many knew John 3.16? Nobody hardly knew John 3.16. So they go, uh, and now they're put on the spot. And they felt embarrassed a little bit. And so the church was way down here in their biblical knowledge. And so, but the, any potential elder had to be higher in terms of their biblical knowledge. It's hard to teach people something you don't know. And so as the church gets higher in its biblical background and training, then the elder board has to grow as well with that. And so here we are, that's, that's, that's a changing thing. That's not static, how do we know? You know, at a new church, Paul and Jamie are starting this new church. They're gonna have new people there and people that aren't saved. You don't put them in as elders. So here's what I want you to catch. This leadership has nothing to do with eldership. Now, they are leaders, but let me drop this in and say it this way. The word leader is never used to describe a pastor or an elder in the New Testament church. So instead of saying, let's look at all these leaders and let's put them in, let's look at all the servants. What does Jesus say? You know, if you want to lead, then the Son of Man came to do what? To serve. And if you're going to be like him, you're going to serve. And if you humble yourself, God will exalt you. But if you say, I'm in charge and I'm the leader, so the word leader is never used to describe a pastor. How about this other word? The word leadership is never used to describe a pastor or an elder in a New Testament church. So whether it's he, he's, he is a leader or he has leadership skills, we don't go and learn. This is not a professional job. It's not a job where you go and you say, okay, I've got so much schooling, therefore I qualify. I'm going to be a pastor. That's the problem in the American church today. Uh, John uh, Piper wrote the book, Two Pastors. The, the title is this, Brothers, We Are Not Professionals. We're not the CEO of this corporation. This is a corporation. It's called Faith Community Church of Palmdale. It's a corporation. But we're not CEOs of this corporation we're the, the, the pastors, you know, uh, uh, for years uh, uh, until uh, about 1948, 1950, in that era. What did you always call? What were the pastors called? Pastor. You probably didn't even know his name. And that's a good reason, you know, to just they call him pastor. A couple of things. You don't elevate his name and he's not the best known guy in the world. Secondly, you remind him what he's supposed to be doing. What is he supposed to be doing? Pastoring and shepherding. How did, that, how did we get away from that? How we got away from that, believe it or not, is when Billy Graham came along and Billy Graham preached all the time. And then Billy Graham would look into the camera and say, you know, just write me, Billy Graham, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And people said, well, if Billy Graham is Billy Graham, then uh, John is John and Joe is Joe and Paul is Paul. And we forgot to remind people what they should be doing. Do you as a parent want your kids calling you? Hey, Linda. You know, one day my son spun around and, and called me by my first name when he's a little tyke. And I said, well, you can do that. That's, that's my name. But I said, you know, there are only two people in this world that can call me dad. And that's a relationship. You have something special. And we need to be reminding elders and pastors. It's amazing to me uh, what uh, 
cults do. What do they, what do, they do? What, what do Mormons call their leaders? <laughs> Elders. They remind them what they're supposed to be doing. But we want, we, uh, as parents, we want to be their, their kid's best friend and, rather than their parent, rather than their dad, rather than their mom. You know, one of the, great, one of the greatest joys in my life is to be called dad. And at times, you know, when they're growing up, daddy. You know, because it's that relationship. And that, and W.A. Criswell, who used to be the pastor for more than 50 years of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, used to say the greatest joy he had was to be called pastor. Because he said, I'm reminded then what I'm supposed to be doing. And he pastored a church of over 25,000 people. And you know what he did all the time? Anybody that visited his church, they got a visit from him at their house. Now, he didn't stay long because it was a big church, but he would take somebody and they would take him around. Somebody had plotted out the, where they would go. And so as p- new people came, he'd show up at their doorstep. And can you imagine if a, you, if a pastor of a church of 25,000 people shows up on your doorstep? You kind of go, wow, I'm kind of surprised about that because he wanted to care and shepherd people. This message today is for you to know what we're looking for, what you should be looking for, and even the next pastor, and the, and the next elders, and what our shepherds, our elders, need to be doing as elders. They are not there because of leadership. They're there because God has set them apart for this. So let me say it this way. The leader, the elders are not elders because of leadership, but even though the word leadership isn't used in the New Testament, every church needs leaders, but no church needs a dictator. And that's why we have multiple eldership in our church. That's why when I told you about the guy that said, raise your hand if this guy doesn't qualify, what's he doing? He's saying, this guy doesn't work with me, so I'm going to erase his name. Is that what we want to do? Absolutely not. One of, our, one of our pastors was having a difficult time with one of our people. This goes back a few years. And they weren't sure how to handle it. And, and I said, you know, let me assign you. I'm going to assign you with this person. I want you to have to work with him. Because there's a reason God gives you people that are against you at times. And that irritate you at times. Why is that? God gives those people to you so that you learn what? Patience and love. And if you're going to be the senior pastor someday, someplace, whether here or someplace else, you need to know that the way to work with problem people is not to kick them out. It's to get them close and to love on them. So we don't need dictators we need godly people. So in 1 Peter chapter 5, let me launch in there and say, here's where Peter goes with the text. Actually, there's the word, what's interesting to me, we try to get to the best translations possible. And every time we look at some translations, they do some things differently. They throw something out that was really good or really... The, the Christian Standard Bible, before it came out in 2017... The Christian Standard Bible used what others, some other translations have here. There's a word that's at the beginning here. It's the Greek word un, uh, uh, amakron, upsilon, nu, and it means therefore. Or, so now that I've t- said this, so now that I've said this, let me say this, let me say that. What's interesting, the Christian Standard Bible, the old translation, had the therefore in, the, in there. This translation, the newest one, drops it out. And I'm going, no. And and sometimes the the NIV drops it out. I think the New American Standard has it in there. Because they're trying to keep the flow and they're trying to, but you need to understand that he's saying, therefore, on the basis of what I've just been telling you in chapters one, two, three, and four, therefore, on the basis of that, let me tell you this. Therefore, I exhort elders among you as a fellow elder myself, by the way, who's writing this? Peter, the apostle Peter. And what had he done? 
He had denied the Lord. He'd walked away. He'd not done well. And by the way, let me say it this way. If Peter was the first pope, he didn't know it. So how does he write? I exhort the elders, the elders in this, that church that he's writing, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. He didn't say, as the pope, I'm writing you. I'm going to give you his direction. He says, I'm just one of you. As a matter of fact, the, the Catholic church says it perhaps correctly. They don't practice it correctly. Okay? They say that the pope is the first amongst equals. Did you catch that? He just, somebody has to be in charge a little bit. So, you know, somebody organizes the meeting and somebody is the chairman, but does, should he have any more important vote? You know, when our elder board meets, I, I'm the chairman of our elder board, but I don't vote unless there's a, a tie and then I hate to vote because, I, you know, I'm saying, wait a minute, we're not all on the same page here. But, I'm just the person that just gives them the agenda and, and organizes the thing. And we're all, we all have one vote, whether it's me or any other elder. Does that mean that we shouldn't try to persuade other people? Yeah, we can do that. But I'm just, if we were to say it like the Catholic Church used to say it about the Pope, I'm just the first amongst equals. I'm usually the one up here so people know me a little more than they do the other person. But does that give me any more vote or any more say or any more authority? No. Does it give Peter any more? What's he call himself? Therefore, I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder, I'm writing you, and as a witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, I want you to do this. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, or, but eagerly. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now what's interesting about this passage of scripture is it's sandwiched right in the midst of of all these chapters uh, in, in the book of, of 1 Peter. It's not a large book. It's, as a matter of fact, it's just a little bitty short book. Only five chapters here. But I want you to see the emphasis. Look at the screen. Here is the emphasis in these five chapters of Peter. It's on suffering. And he's going to write to the elders right in the midst of this suffering. Let me put this on the screen. These are the times in 1 Peter that talk about how you suffer, how you suffered, how you're suffering, or how you're going to have sufferings. Here they are. All the times in the book of 1 Peter. 18 times in five chapters. 18 times if you count the two times in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1. He's talking about what? Suffering. I almost, <clears throat> I almost wonder what the health, wealth, and prosperity people do with this kind of a book. Oh, God mean, God wants you to be happy and healthy and terrific, and you should have all the money you want and all the health you want, and whenever you're sick, God always has to heal. No, he doesn't. What's this whole book about? Suffering. Whether it's physical suffering or under attack from somebody, it's about, it's about suffering. And it's in that context that he's going to tell you about elders. So let me do this. Let me uh, just uh, group out a segment here in Second Peter, in First Peter chapter two, verses twenty, twenty-one, and twenty-three. Let me lift those out and show you what we're supposed to be like when you do what is good and suffer. You ever done something good and end up suffering for it? When you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. Did you catch that? That you could actually have favor with God by just enduring through it rather than complaining to everybody else and complaining to God. 
When you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. For you were called to this. Called to what? To potentially suffer. You were called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Did you catch that? So he suffered, and he says, here's how to suffer. And he says, you should follow in his steps. And he brings us up in every single chapter. And in the midst of all of that, that's why the therefore is there in chapter 5, verse 1. On the basis of this, follow in his steps. Therefore, elders, here's what I want to say to you. Let me slide this up further. Follow in his steps. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. So here's the deal. So with the majority of the book focused on suffering, Peter now turns to the elders and challenges them to take care of these suffering people. You see, when Tim was the only elder left at the little church on the corner before they said to West Valley Church here, you can just have the facility, just take it over. Tim had pastors come. Great, some great speakers. Some of the some uh, top-notch speakers, much better than me. But Tim said, and the people would say, "Oh, that's, that's the one. Let's get that one, man. That he can really illustrate and he can really speak. And man, he's is great. Let's get this one." And Tim would say, "No, what we want, what we're looking for, is someone who will shepherd. Who will, you know, we're not looking for the best speaker. We're looking for the 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 best caregiver." that will say, God, you tell me what you want me to do, and that's what we'll do. Not because uh, I, I'm Billy Graham, or not because I'm John MacArthur, or Chuck Swindoll, or some other great speaker. You want somebody that says, hey, let's call these people. Hey, let's, you know, I said to our, I said to our staff all the time, Look, we, have all our, we all have our specific jobs here in our church, but one of the things I want you to do is I want you to call five families every week and just connect with them. In addition to all your other work, just out there calling. You need to be caring, not just about your ministry, but this is a way to cross-pollinate. So when you talk to them, ask them what they're doing in missions and then feed that to Curtis in missions and ask them what they're going to, hey, are they serving in some capacity? And then give that to Brad because Brad's job is to assimilate and, and get these guys plugged in, these people plugged in. We want, we want to connect with people. The tendency in the American church is, hey, I'm the pastor. What's my only job and main job? I'll get up here and I'll preach. And you come and sit. And then we've got a church. That's not church. Church is this body of believers that ministers to one another. If I'm the only guy doing that, if the elders are the only people doing that, we're not doing it the way God wants it done. So the majority of the book focused on that. He says, come on, elders, here's what I want you to do. So here's what I'm going to tell you this morning. It's unbelievable that God uses men with all their flaws to lead his church. Can you imagine the God of the universe saying, I'm going to entrust this to? Really? He's going to entrust it to us, his church? That'd be like you, when your baby is born, you saying, okay, here's my baby. You take care of it now. I think you'll be the best for it. And we'd say, let's keep it in mom's hands. Let's keep it in dad's hands. Let's not hand them out to somebody else. But God says, here, this is a new believer. This is a new believer. I'm going to hand them to you. I'm going to give them to your care. And this is unbelievable that God uses men like me or our men to lead, to become elders of the church. Peter uses four words to describe what these men should do. Let me give them to you now. They're witnesses, they're shepherds, they're overseers, 
and there are examples. The first one is kind of unique. He says, I'm a witness. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a what? A witness to the sufferings of Christ. Who's the witness to the sufferings of Christ? Who's talking here? Peter. He said, yep, I was right there. I really failed, but I was right there. And I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. I even went into that courtyard. And when I saw him in the courtyard, yeah, I I watched him being put under persecution. I knew what he was going to face. He told us he was going to die that night. And what I do, I, I denied him. But I'm a witness to the sufferings of Christ. And you know how Peter ended up dying according to tradition? They put him upside down. He said, I can't, I don't want to, I'm not even worthy to be uh, killed the way Christ went, was crucified for us. Hang me upside down. So here's the word that's used for witness. Martos in the Greek. Martos. Let me slide it up here. Martos, the mu, that first Greek letter is a mu. And what letter does it sound like in English? Mu. The M. The next letter is the alpha. He said, I am the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha. And that alpha becomes our A. The next letter looks like our P, but it's their rho. Their rho. And that becomes that R sound, rho, ra, rho. That next letter is the T, the tau for them. It's the T for us. That upsilon, whenever you see that occur, almost always we translate it into English with a letter they don't have, and it's the letter Y. And then we add here the letter R, and what do you have? A martyr. And what is a witness? A witness, a martyr witnesses to the, to the faith of the Lord. And Peter said, yep, I've done that. Nobody will ever become an elder here that can't witness to their identifying with the sufferings of Christ. Paul said it this way. You say, well, but but we haven't really seen it. Here's what Paul said. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul wasn't there when he was crucified, but Paul said, that's my goal and that's what I'm going to witness about and that's what we witness about when we have communion. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so we want to witness to that. And again, no one will ever become an elder at Faith Community Church without first bearing witness that they have trusted Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. So one of the very first things we have them share as they sit down with us, and they're already, you know, people that, are, that we know and, and love, but we say, okay, tell us when you trusted Christ. Witness to us what went on in your life. And Peter says, if you're not doing that, we can't make you an elder. If you can't witness to what God has done in your heart and life and and to the, the crucifixion and the sufferings of Christ. But that's not the only thing. What God uses men, even with flaws, to lead the church. And he uses the four words. First word is witness. The second word is shepherds. Shepherds. Here's the way it's used in the text. Therefore, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, shepherd God's flock among you. Shepherd. You know, we, I've never hung out with a shepherd. I, I, probably the best thing to do is, is if somebody wants to be a pastor is to say, okay, we want to sign you to spend the next week. We're going to pay you go out and work with that shepherd. Really get to know what's going on here. The Greek word for shepherd looks like this, moimenetet, moimenetet. It's used specifically of Peter when, when Christ was going to restore him. And here's how it's used in John chapter 21, verse 16. A second time, Jesus asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Remember what he had done? He had denied the Lord three times. Three times the Lord's gonna ask him, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? 
Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Same Greek word here. Shepherd my sheep. You know what he's saying? I want you to do? I want you to guard my sheep. I want you to watch over my sheep. They're kind of foolish at times, and they wander away, and they don't know when the, the wolves come in, and they don't know when the snakes are there, and they don't know. So I want you to shepherd them. I want you to guard them. Use it again in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Be on your guard for yourselves and for all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. What's he asking us to do? Shepherd. A liberal <laughs> that we would look at, a person that we would call liberal, his name is N.T. Wright. As a matter of fact, when, uh, when uh, the Master's College wrote an article on N.T. Wright, on the New Paul Perspective, the article was, is N.T. right or wrong? But here's what he said about shepherding, because not everybody is wrong all the time. Here's what he says in a good sense. The point about shepherds is that the best of them aren't thinking, how can I be a shepherd? How can I be a shepherd? But how can I best look after these sheep? Do you hear the difference? It's not about how can I do the best? How can I be important? But how can I care for those people? N.T. Wright also said it this way, the focus of the good shepherd is not only on his own qualities, but on the needs of and potential dangers for those they are looking after. That's what shepherds need to be doing, looking out for things. Let me do this. I'm going to take this same statement and let me highlight what shepherds are supposed to be doing. The focus of the good shepherd is on those they are looking after. Do you see it? So what's, what's our focus to be as elders? Not on us, but on the church body. Elders, shepherds, they're, they're witnesses about the Lord, but they're shepherds, and let me say it this way, shepherds are around the sheep so much that they start to smell like them. And where I go with our staff and where I want you to go with our elders is when we have events at our church, we want elders to be involved. We're not out there doing our own thing in, in every different area. We, we don't ask them to be at everything. We're asking them to shepherd, to be with the sheep enough that they start to smell like them. Let me give you this video. Uh, and Ken, uh, you'll turn this up, but this video was filmed in uh, Norway. This is a Norwegian man. He's a shepherd. And what do we know about shepherds? Our elders are supposed to be shepherds. And the sheep hear my what? Voice. And when they hear the shepherd's voice, they, oh, I'm safe. You can see the haze on the mountainside. He's out there. I have no other way to show you. This is a couple of minutes. I hate to in inject this in here, but I want you to hear the thrust of this. This is a shepherd, and the sheep are in the fog and the haze up on the hillside, and they don't see the shepherd down there. It's kind of like you in this world, and you don't see what's going on, but here's what goes on in this time. This is not professionally done. He's speaking in Norwegian. He's calling the sheep.
John, don't you wish you could do that with the cattle? <laughs> Look at the sheep are still coming. He's called them in. My sheep hear my voice. And what do they do? Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And what do we do? We go there to get fed. And we go there because we know his voice. And what does he do? He's there to protect and to provide. What does what the does farmer do say? That? The farmer says, They, hear on they know the voice of the shepherd. And he knows theirs. Amen. Amen. <laughs> what are we supposed to be? As elders, we're supposed to be close enough to the people that they, they know his voice, the shepherd's voice, and we're this under shepherd. And what are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be helping them. Look, God uses men, even with the flaws, to lead the church. Here are the words he uses to describe. You're to be witnesses. Uh, you're to be shepherds. Oh, you're to be overseers. Here's how it's worded. I exhort the elders among you as fellow elders and witnesses to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed. Shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly. What are you supposed to be doing? Overseeing. Overseeing is the Greek word episcopon. We get our English word episcopal or the Episcopalian church. You ever heard of that church? They've drifted a long ways from being the overseers, but they're supposed to be this, this bishop who's there to guard and to care. Peter uses this word earlier in 1 Peter this way, in 1 Peter 2.25, for you were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. This guy is supposed to be an overseer. The Lord is, the overseer is one who watches over the welfare of others. What are Pastor Saul? and Myron, and Tim, and Caleb, and I, and Dave, and Bob Schumann, supposed to be doing? Watching over the welfare of others. I'm on, I want to challenge you to pray that they do that. And I want to challenge them that they do that. Look, God's going to use men, all their flaws. Here are the words, you're a witness, you're a shepherd, you're an overseer. Ah, you're an example. Boy, I wish that were a better example. Uh, if, anybody, if anybody reaches the point where they say, well, I'm the best example, <laughs> then they're probably not a good example. All I can say is I wish I were a better example. And that we ought to strive, you ought to strive, but our elders ought to never be satisfied with their walk with the Lord. They ought to want to go further. They ought to go deeper. And they ought to care more. But there to be an example. Here's what the text says. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and witness to the sufferings of Christ, as well as one who shares in the glory about to be revealed, shepherd God's flock among you, not overseeing out of compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not out of greed for money, but eagerly, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being what? And will you notice their examples to what kind of people? The flock. And what do we know about sheep and the flock? They wander away. What do we know about sheep and flock? They're not easily, they're easily frightened at times. That's why he, he leads them beside the still water, so they don't get so frightened. The Greek word for example is tupas. 
tupas. We use it all the time in English. It looks like this. That tau becomes our T. I told you the upsilon often gets translated with what letter that they don't have in Greek? The Y. The pi becomes our P. And the omicron, the next letter, becomes our O. And when we have a typo, <laughs> what do we say? What's a typo? Uh, or, or we sometimes put the E in there and it's type. We used to use that all the time. But who uses it much anymore? Look at Typo, type, means to strike and make an impression. That's what we used to do with a typewriter, correct? Nobody uses a typewriter anymore. The word typewriter means what? To strike and make an impression. And what did it do? It would strike the paper and the ribbon and make a what? An impression. But now, I used to have one of those nice IBM Selectric self-correcting, you know, and all that kind of stuff. I upgraded it. I, I, when the computers came out, you know, back in 1977, when I first got my first computer, I upgraded my Selectric typewriter. I tore the thing whole, all apart. Here's a $650 typewriter, and I tear it all apart and insert solenoid switches and everything so that my Selectric typewriter was the first one to work with one of the little bitty computers that we used to have. And that little head on that thing went... <laughs> That ball was just spinning so fast because it was moving the impulses on the inside and it was doing it at the speed of the computer. But that's nothing compared to the printers today. Why take all the time to watch that little head go? I don't even know where that IBM Selectric is today. But it made, yeah, it, it was worn out when I had it going but it made an impression. The question I have for you and for our elders, are we making godly impressions on people that people can read what's going on in their lives? You are written epistles, read of all men. And God's saying, look, I, I want you to be like the good shepherd. And the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The hirelings aren't that way. They run when there are problems. I want to challenge our elders to run to the problems and to run to the people who are suffering and hurting. And let's do what God wants us to do. Let's pray. While your heads are bowed, while your eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you to pray that you can be godly examples for people. That you'll be like shepherds to people. And then I'm going to ask you to pray that God would use our elders to be the kind of shepherds, the kind of overseers, the kind of examples, the kind of witnesses that God wants us to be. That our church would be blessed because of that. That those who wander off like sheep that sometimes we'll leave the 90 and 9 and go after the one. And then find that one and we come back and we say to you, rejoice with me. And that which was lost is now found. Would you pray that God would use the elders here the way he wants to use them for his glory. In Christ's name, amen.